It's, it's, as I understand it, every member of the Rolling Stones was addicted to heroin at one time. Um, do you think that Ibogaine could have, and, and they were depleted, their, their, their ability to work was often depleted, like Keith Richards, um, when, when he was working on Exile on Main Street, he, he could not do the work for one of the songs, and the lead had to be dubbed in by another performer because of his heroin problem. Do you think that Ibogaine could help any artistic people, perhaps, who, in their lives? The answer to that is yes and no. Uh, for instance, out of the original seven persons who were treated in the 1960s who were heroin dependent, and you have to understand this about that group, none of that group was seeking to stop their own dependence. This was simply an Ibogaine experiment. No anticipated effect. No anticipated effects. No desire to stop heroin use. Uh, we simply took the ibogaine to see what effects ibogaine would have. And 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 you were like blown away and amazed by the fact that that, that it had this effect on you, I suppose. Well, I, I, I probably was the most amazed. And uh, for instance, two of the, of the persons in the group, uh, after their ibogaine, after their ibogaine experience got up the next morning and said, well, we're going to go cop some heroin. And I said, well, uh, how come you guys are going to get heroin? You're not sick, are you? And they said, no. I said, well, I don't understand. I said, well, we like being heroin addicts. And, and that it doesn't work with everybody. It doesn't, not only doesn't work, it's that, you know, you have to look at what people want. And uh, a lot of people don't want to stop using any given particular drug. So these two guys decided that fit their image and benefited them to be heroin addicts. Now, I have to make an important point, and I think, I think you would concur with me. We're not advocating that anybody go out and, un, and use Ibogaine in an unsupervised context. No, in fact, uh, Ibogaine is probably, the, when, in terms of purchasing Ibogaine, Ibogaine is probably the strangest drug you can buy in the whole world. Ibogaine, for the most part, comes with a provider. 95% uh, of the time, if you're going to go buy a dose of Ibogaine, somebody who's going to take care of you comes with it. I'm not kidding. Okay. You know, you might be able to get some random doses over the internet, but basically thousands and thousands of procedures are, are, are given around the world, and virtually every time you get a dose of Ibogaine, you get somebody to take care of you, whether it's a medical doctor or a, a, an African shaman or somebody from a self-help group or a medical Let's talk about the Ibogaine experience, Howard. Uh, what tests do you uh, recommend that individuals uh, receive uh, medical tests before they receive Ibogaine? Uh, can you mention some of them? Sure. Uh, what we've learned, and there have been a few fatalities out of about 8,000 Ibogaine treatments, there are, out of about 8,000 Ibogaine treatments, there have been possibly 18 fatalities. And we started looking at this really closely. And what we reckon uh, out of like 3,000? No, 8,000. 8,000, okay. So that's a small, a relatively, relatively small. Relatively small, but you know. Compared we, to the, the harm of uh, drug use. Well, when you're in charge, though, every, every, every dead body is a dead body that you don't want to see. So what we're able to recognize immediately is that a certain subset of those patients had prior cardiac conditions, which were either prolongation of what they call the QT interval which uh, precipitates certain cardiac arrhythmias, or uh, they had blockage of the main arteries to the heart. So the first thing we want to do is make sure that these people are not coming into treatment, or if they come into treatment, they're coming into medical hospitals with uh, intensive care units available and can be monitored extensively. So the three tests that, that I would suggest that anybody thinking about Ibogaine uh, get would be uh, an EKG, an echo stress test, which is a, a, a further look into the heart and how it's function, functioning, and a general uh, uh, blood chemistry, particularly uh, liver enzymes. Just you want to make sure that your liver is functioning because one of the things that Ibogaine does is it throws an active metabolite. In fact, most drugs do this. When you take a drug, it gets metabolized through your liver. And sometimes the, the, the liver uh, provides an inactive metabolite, and sometimes it throws an active metabolite. In Ibogaine's case, we see an active metabolite, which is commonly called nor Ibogaine. 
Now, Howard, I saw a video where this guy uh, had a lot of things attached to his head. What was that during the Ibogaine uh, session? This was part of a clinical research program, and there was continual monitoring of the of, the, his, e, of his EEG waves. Oh, for the brain waves. We were just, uh, you know, we, this is, you know, it was in a modern hospital in the Republic of Panama, and we wanted to see if there were any adverse effects to the uh, to the book, to the brain electrochemistry, and there was none, but we have to look before you know. Now, uh, some of my students wanted to know, is ibogaine addictive? Ibogaine is not addictive. It has an anti-addictive effect, even for itself. Uh, good. There, there, that sounds very good. That's there, not addictive. There have been some people, for instance, who have used low-dose ibogaine in an attempt to modulate uh, the use of opiates, which are being given for, for in pain management programs, and they've been able to reduce uh, the dose of opiates by, by taking concurrent low doses of ibogaine. But after about two weeks, what they found is that uh, ibogaine itself begins to have adverse effects which are similar to a flu or a cold, and they stop. Okay. Now, folks, we're going to, as Larry King does, we're going to take a short break, uh, 30, minute, 30 seconds, and we'll be right back with you. So please stand by. Okay, we're back with Howard Lotsoff, and uh, Howard, I'd like to ask you, uh, after they're cured, are people tempted to try ibogaine again because, uh, you know, uh, to try, uh, I mean, so, I'm sorry, after they're cured, are they tempted to try heroin again because they know that they can get rid of it with ibogaine? Okay. One, ibogaine is not a cure, ibogaine is an interrupter. And uh, yes, people are tempted to try heroin again. I'll, I'll give you a very brief example. One of the first people treated was an American who was brought over to the Netherlands and treated with Ibogaine. And then uh, his wife was living in Denmark, so he moved to Denmark. And I just recently met him again, and what he said happened was uh, two weeks after he took Ibogaine, uh, he took heroin and didn't like it. And two months later, he took Ibogaine, took heroin again, and didn't like it. And two years later, he took heroin again and didn't like it. But you also get people, and uh, just like those two people in the original study, who do like heroin and are going to go back to heroin. Okay. And uh, somebody, uh, this is a question that comes up all the time. Well, will people use heroin if they know there's an effective treatment to stop? And I don't think people are going to make a decision on using heroin based on anything except their desire to use heroin. I think you're absolutely right. Now, could I hope and cure other things besides heroin? Ibogaine is an effective treatment for multiple forms of chemical dependence. That's alcohol, nicotine, cocaine, methamphetamine. Now, when we first addressed this issue in 1984 with the Nationalists and our drug abuse, there was complete disbelief on their part because they did not understand how a single drug could treat so many different drugs when their theory at that time was single receptors for single drugs. It's amazing. It's just astounding that this could work. Well, what they've now found out by following Ibogaine is that all drug dependency will multi-receptor responses. It's not just opiates for opiate receptors. You put an opiate on an opiate receptor, it affects dopamine, it affects serotonin, it affects NMDA, it affects multiple This is a miracle. Systems. Howard, you gotta, you got to admit, this sounds like a miracle, that this one substance from Africa could, could treat or interrupt the addiction to heroin, cocaine, alcohol, nicotine, and a host of other substances. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Hard to believe. Hard to believe, and uh, that's what the, the response we get. But what happened was, uh, in our determinant determination to prove it, National Institute of Drug Abuse said, we want to see this in the animal model experiment. We said to them, animals are animals and people are people. But we went and we moved into animal model studies, and what we found out, at least, at least where drug experimentation is concerned, animals and people are very similar in terms of how they respond to drugs. Now, a couple of quick questions is, could ibogaine possibly help with psychological issues? The answer is, without a doubt, yes. Uh, it's been shown in some of the clinical work uh, that was accomplished by Deborah Mash at her facility in St. Kitts that ibogaine has an antidepressant and uh, an antihypertensive effect as well. Now let's show a piece of proof. we got a few other things to cover, and that is 
I want to I want to know about getting the word out. Howard, you discovered something, um, and it's an amazing thing. Bruce Sekow is here, ladies and gentlemen. He is the man who wrote Friday the 13th. The screenwriter for that movie is here, and uh, I, I think there should be a movie about this. But what have you done to get the word out to the world? Well, we've, we've been on we've been on uh, Beyond Two. We've been on the Beyond Two Thousand show. We've been on ABC Day One. Uh, we've been in the New York Times. Uh, I 